Hello, everybody, and welcome to this next episode of the podcast here for our November Lobby Month. My name is John Gilchrist, and I'm the Director of Communications here at Therasil. And I'm so, so happy to introduce Dave Phillips. Dave is a, is a trainer and an advisor here with Therasil, and he's, uh, he's a Therasil original. And is OG, OG, is not the OG, yeah, therapist OG. And um, Dave does at least one training a month with Therasil. He's so intimately involved in everything that we do. And thank you so much for making the time to, to chat with me today, Dave. This Happy to support our ongoing efforts, my friend. Awesome. So I guess maybe we can start by you telling me what led you to Therasil and in general, what led you to psychedelic psychotherapy? Yeah, it's a, for me, it was a kind of a progression in my own professional life. So I've been a therapist, uh, really starting in the late eighties, over 30 years now. And the bulk of my work through the years, like most of us therapists, uh, was trauma and, uh, certainly started treating for with a trauma informed lens, you know, back in the nineties. And, uh, even when, before we even kind of had the, that terminology back then, and uh, have really uh, loved that framework. I just think most people's problems are best understood through the lens of, of trauma or injury. And uh, yet I was uh, beginning, you know, in about 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, starting to feel quite a bit of therapeutic fatigue in terms of uh, there was, well, a number of my clients absolutely were responding well to treatment and that's beautiful when that happens. Uh, there was a percentage, and I, you know, I'll ballpark it around 40%, something like that, a good number, <clears throat> who, despite my best therapeutic work, their absolute courageous hard work that they brought to the to the sessions, we just could, couldn't get past a certain point. It it just and uh, it, it was very frustrating. And I'm not the only one. I mean, I'm, I'm a supervisor and an educator, and I've been well connected with the field throughout uh, throughout my career. And, Knowing this was almost like a, a collective kind of uh, lament for all of us that that we could only take clients so far. And I was actually just thinking, maybe maybe I'm done. Maybe I just can't work with this. And I remember it was about seven years ago, I read an article about uh, from an organization called MAPS, which I'd never heard of, and talking about the use of MDMA uh, for PTSD. Now, at the time, uh, I, I'd been doing some work in the uh, wellness space and uh, running a substance use uh, program and uh, and I'd gone to a conference and I remember the keynote speaker is a brilliant scientist and she said of all the street drugs in her opinion the most dangerous was ecstasy and she went on to explain why now I, I'm a dope I don't know and I just know that I just thought to myself MDMA bad and so when I read this article uh, I just said yeah I just can't buy that that's just not solid because about six months later, I read another article on Johns Hopkins University using psilocybin, which I didn't even know what that was, found those magic mushrooms, for the use, uh, for treating uh, end-of-life anxiety for cancer patients. And that, for me, it was the, you know, my regard for Hopkins, Johns Hopkins as an academic university, uh, uh, research, uh, research institution, and I just thought to myself, wow. Uh, I started to look into it. And then, you know, like most of us, once I started getting into the research, when I started getting into the, into the articles, I, my eyes just were opened to uh, a new breakthrough in therapeutic uh, um, models. And um, I mean, I just knew it. I, I knew that we found something substantially different and I would just couldn't wait to get at it. So I, I started doing my kind of own study uh, for a number of years and uh, eventually led me to the Psychedelics Today's Psychedelics Today podcast. And uh, Joe and Kyle, who were wonderful with me, they supported me and started getting me connected. And I started to do my own kind of uh, learning. And, you know, I'm pretty bright. I know therapy really, really well. So I didn't need a lot of education there. I was really trying to understand psychedelics. I took some coursework. And uh, then I, uh, I connected with a, a real uh, leader in Canada. Uh, in psychedelic medicine and and uh, he just said until you have your own experience mm -hmm. uh, your education can really only go so far so as things worked out i was able to get connected to a, a very gifted um, underground therapist who led me on my own experience and after that i knew that that we we had stumbled onto something good started working with uh, what i call friendlies non-clinical folks to learn the the process and then um I, I started working with a cancer patient, uh, Lori Brooks, who's, mm. you 
you know, the subject of the Dose 2 documentary, Lori's just such a beautiful person, but her, at that time, her life was in really, really bad shape. And that, that my role with, uh, with Lori, we got connected to someone who knew of the work of Theracell and they kind of, you know, made some connections. And so I got connected with Theracell and just recognized right on as I met with Spencer and the team that there was a real synergy of values that we saw the saw the universe saw this in the same way and they told me what they're doing in terms of ag advocacy so i got on board and that led us to you know the 2020 um uh exemption section 56 exemptions being uh passed by the health minister for lori and then subsequently for myself to use it for training and because i've done so much work in the training and education space uh Theracell invited me to develop a course for therapists and healthcare professionals, and that was uh, back in March of 2021. We started our first cohort. I'm now, I think I'm on my 14th or 15th cohort now, and uh, it's just very, very exciting to see how, uh, you know, we're, we're really advancing in, in this model, which is, you know, really important. It's a very different way of working. So it's very important that healthcare professionals get trained on this. It's not, it, and as you know, John, but I'll just say it out loud, we have to say this so often because of cultural conditioning. This is not psilocybin therapy. This isn't just take mushrooms and you're automatically going to be better. This is a very well-researched therapeutic model, which involves preparation, the dosing session, then integration. And done in that way, the numbers that, that are coming from the research world are just almost, almost unbelievable for so many different clinical applications, but we're looking at 70 to 80% recovery. And, uh, you know, it really is, represents a, a, just a new way of treating mental mental illness in general, mental health problems. And yet at the same time, because these substances, you know, uh, are scheduled, they're not, they're, they're illegal for use. You know, we've had to, you know, work so carefully with the governing agencies to make sure that, you know, we're all working together. And, you know, the purpose of our advocacy work is that has been kind of frustrating. You know, I get it that uh, from the point of view of Health Canada, they are, you know, wanting to make sure this is a safe, uh, procedure where, you know, safety is huge for us as a value, but, you know, we're also saying, hey, this is compassionate use. The, you know, the, the fundamental uh, legal question, do Canadians have the right to use plant medicine for relief of their medical conditions? And, you know, I, I think the answer is quite clearly, yes, they do. And then that's why we're pushing. But kind of that's how I got connected with there. So I'm very, very pleased that my, my career has taken this kind of turn. Well, me too, Dave. I mean, I, uh, I actually got to I've never really thank you for your participation in creating the training. I actually got to do the training myself um, back in July. Yeah, I know. Like, uh, I'm just some guy. I'm not a, tr a psychotherapist or anything. But <laughs> just a guy. I, yeah, I was invited to to participate in kind of like a communications role to see what it's like. And so okay. I actually got to, but Joseph DeLeo, who was. Oh, it was Joseph's uh, cohort. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. As soon yeah. as I got there on Monday morning, he was like, oh, you thought you would just be taking notes. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's not how this works. That's right. Yeah. Like, yeah this right. is your dyad partner, and this is yeah. how we're going to do things. A lot of the psychotherapy obviously went over my head, but it was like, yeah. I, I don't think I, I've been angry once since that week. It was wow. just like. What a beautiful story. Like, it was great. I, I just, I, I felt so full, and I made 11 really good friends. Um, I, I'll remember all their names forever. Yeah. The training was like. Oh, that's what a great story. Was, I love that. That's great, John. So happy for you. Yeah, and I guess, um, why do you think psychedelics are so powerful, Dave? Like, why, especially for folks experiencing end of life anxiety? Like, what is this? What does this yeah. do for them? So, I mean, there's, we could we could really answer the question kind of uh, from a, maybe a spiritual perspective, and I think that's valid. Uh, but I, I, you know, I'm kind of a brain guy, so I mean, I'm really I like to think of the brain and neuroscience behind it, and what we believe right now. The kind of the most robust theory kind of in our, in our world is that um, there's a part of our brain that I'll get really I'm going to geek out on you for a bit, but there's a part of our brain called the default mode network. And it's just it's just identified. It's a hub of, of three organizing networks in the cortex. And under normal kind of conditions, what I mean by that, if a person is just generally grown up pretty healthy and doesn't have trauma, they're, they're, this part of the brain works kind of organically, what I'll call with their kind of core values of life, so that more or less they stay connected to who they want to be, kind of, you know, how they want to be uh, interacting in the universe, the kind of career, kind of life they want. More or less, I'll say there's alignment with those. 
But when we have, I'll use trauma as just one example, but there can be other other reasons, but trauma is probably the one that we most uh, connect with most easily. If there's early childhood trauma, for example, uh, the brain switches into more of a survival mode, a defense mode. The brain itself is a is just kind of an organ, is, is just worried that, that our lives are in danger all of the time. And so, especially as a human being begins to develop, then this part of the brain that's in charge of that becomes very rigid. And, and so that, you know, here we are now as adults, you know, 30 years later, and we're still operating as if our lives are kind of in danger. And this part of our brain can become very, very strong and, and kind of controlling of our lives. And, and that can be mental habits like depression or anxiety. It can be, you know, habitual things like addictions or behavioral addictions. And then, you know, the most common thing I see when people come in, if I use, say, someone with a, with a cancer, for example, they come and sit down with me and, they, you know, I say, what do you want? You know, and of course, they say, well, I don't want to have cancer. Go, okay, well, that's not on the menu. I said, but, but what do you want for your life? And they all say the same thing, John. They say, I don't want to be afraid. I want to be present to my life. I don't want to withdraw from my family, my friends. Uh, I want to know what's next. I want to know what life after death is like. I want to know what my family can be. All these beautiful, beautiful values. And yet that's not where their life is. I always had like, this is this is where your life is and this is where you want to be. And how come you're not, you know, in that beautiful alignment? Well, what we believe happens during these high dose sessions, and it's not, again, just take the mushroom. There's got to be a, a sense of safety with your guides, a sense of nurturance and, and many other factors. Um, but when you use this medicine in this way at this dosage, what we believe happens, and to quote Dr. Carter Harris is one of the leading uh, neuroscientists in the world of psychedelic medicine, he uses the word deactivate. He thinks we actually deactivate this part of this controlling part of the brain for a short period of time, you know, four, five, six hours. Many people don't love that sensation. I don't, I'll be real honest, because I love my brain. But when, when it starts to deactivate, uh, it can be a bit bumpy. But once you get into the full psychedelic experience, what happens then is that you're, you're now reconnected with your core values. And, and we believe, the, the, again, the most prevailing theory is that during this session, our brain is rewired so that we can, we can have a different perspective on things like I'm afraid to die or, you know, what's next. So, to, you know, to give you just a, a, a very straightforward um, kind of example, a person goes into this state. For instance, saying that I'm not lovable, for example, maybe that's a, just a rigid belief. I don't deserve care. I'm not lovable as a human being. They go through this process. They come out six hours later and they look you in the eye and say, I don't deserve love as much as the next person. Now, as a therapist, John, I don't know how to do that in six hours. Not so it's so deeply believed. And so that's what we think is the kind of mechanism of change. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a powerful treatment. But uh, integrating those changes then over the next six months can have a, a life-changing impact on a person's life. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you mentioned it, Dave, it's, you wouldn't believe how many comments and emails I see that are like, if you guys really want to help people, why don't you just go tell them to buy the mushrooms? Like, you know where to buy them. I'm like, yeah, anyone can buy mushrooms in Canada. They're, yeah. you can buy them at a storefront. And I live in Toronto and on Queen West, yeah. there's a, there's a store you can walk right in and right, buy them. And right. I know they've got them in Vancouver, but the point that we always try to get across is how important the therapy is like it's this is or we would call set and setting i mean i right. suppose we could move outside this the you know the strict rigid therapeutic environment you know as we as we evolve but set and setting are everything so there's right. you know it's really important that you know a person feels safe and that their intentions are there and so we think within our model it's especially for like actual clinical human beings who are you know, seeking help that we want to do it in a very, very safe way and an effective way for them. And that's how, you know, that's how our model has kind of merged the way it does. Right. And I guess the, there is that you mentioned the, the push and pull between this clinical model and the position that Health Canada has with the legal state that at least our, our position would be that, yeah, of course you need clinical trials. Yes, definitely. You yeah. need to, you need to measure this, but with cannabis, right. I, I don't think there was a single clinical trial uh, that happened before they federally legalized it for medical use. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, some days it does feel like the standard is is a little higher, but whatever. I mean, it's you know we'll we will satisfy the the legal requirements. We will jump through the hoops. We will you know take our government to court if we have to. Um, 
But the other, so I meant that's a neuroscientific kind of perspective. There's another perspective that I think is another way of looking at it. That's what I call a spiritual perspective. And this is, this is really challenging for a lot of, you know, hardcore clinicians who in their medical training or their nursing training or their therapeutic training, nobody mentioned the word spirituality. You know, it just wasn't a part of the kind of uh, vernacular. Uh, but we are noticing because so many people have, what we'll call a mystical experience or a peak spiritual experience during their their uh, psilocybin journey, that we have to become very comfortable uh, talking about spirituality, becoming curious about people's experience. And it's interesting in the Hopkins uh, Johns Hopkins research, they they identified this what they call it a mystical experience during the psilocybin journey as being the highest correlated value to outcomes. So that when you do have a sense of, it doesn't have to be with G-O-D, God, or the divine, but a sense of that there's something more beyond me, that I'm known by that something, that I'm part of that something, I'm connected, and that something is, is loving towards me, is beautiful. And even indeed myself, I have, a, I have a kind of a quality of immortality about me. And then when you have, when that, that's not just, you know, told you on an audio book, you read it on a blog, but this is something you experience. When you have an experience of that, it, it, it changes your view on everything, right? It, it, you begin to, like one of the things I, one of the most beautiful things that happens in sessions a lot, and I just love it when it happens, all of a sudden you'll just hear the, the person go into spontaneous laughter. And, and, you know, they're laughing, we're laughing, they're laughing, we don't know what's going on. And later on they tell us, you know, this is so common. I said, what was all the laughing about? They said, I just, you know, I was just looking at my life and all of a sudden it just seems so silly. All the things I worry about just don't seem to matter. And that's such a beautiful thing. I could tell them that. And probably people tell them that all the time. Quit worrying. Don't don't take it so seriously. Well, yeah, sure. I'd, I'd like not to worry, but I can't stop worrying. And they go through this experience and they themselves are the ones saying to them, lighten up. It's not that serious. And again, we see this all the time. So it's just another perspective on, on what's going on in these sessions that seem to shift into these beautiful turnarounds in people's lives. That's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's, I feel like there's always a correlation between psilocybin and laughter. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, yeah. That's brilliant. Like I've, I've said, you know, if you can truly laugh at yourself, I don't mean in a mocking way, but just in kind of like a, like I'm so silly, kind of a, kind of a light way, that there's no antidepressant in the world that is effective in the brain is that. I will sign my name for that statement. Yeah, it's so cool, like hearing from people, like you mentioned the, like almost like a slate cleaning, um, the way that uh, antidepressants or or some sort of other anti anxiety that it, it it makes the the edges less sharp. It makes your your lows less low, but it also makes your highs less high. And that this like a psilocybin. Yeah, and that's the best case scenario. You know, right. that's best case. Oftentimes they don't work at all. They're very very frustrating. And I think you're right, John. Most of our Psych meds are directed towards symptom relief, which is, you know, that, that's nothing wrong with symptom relief. But in the long run, you know, people don't want to be on these meds their whole life. They want to actually get down to the core of the problem, which, you know, research seems to suggest for many people is, is rooted in early childhood injury. And, you know, for me, if that's the case, and again, the research seems to support it, then people don't have to apologize for being injured. They didn't ask for it. It happened to them. It's their responsibility to deal with cleaning their life up, but to, to be able to recognize that, hey, we can treat injuries, right? We don't just have to treat the pain associated with the injuries. We can actually see if we can shift the injury itself. And that, that you know, that's not just psilocybin, but that's ketamine. That's also MDMA, these beautiful medicines that seem to have popped out of nowhere into our world. I mean, I know it's not, but that's what it seems like. And yeah, it's just beautiful. Wow, that's that's so cool. I, I don't think I've heard you say that before. I don't think I've What's heard that? that? Just the the part about treating and not like like an injury like this is uh yeah we're not yeah 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 I mean it's, it's it's the trauma informed model and you know the research would suggest that you know maybe ninety ninety plus percent of all counseling psychology clients their symptoms are are based in in trauma or injury. And, and so we got to be about treating that, which is which when you're dealing with someone who's spent two, three, four decades of their life creating defenses around feeling those feelings, you can imagine how very challenging it is. I mean, I, I knew this, you know, 20 years ago. I just wasn't able to do anything about it. 
how, you know, this it's not that the person doesn't want to get better, but like I say, the, the defense systems are, are so sophisticated. They are now expert at not talking about their feelings. And it doesn't matter how nice and smart and caring I am, we're not going to get through that. It's where the medicines have moved into the space. But finally, we have something that's able to relax the defense systems. MDMA does it very different than ketamine or, or psilocybin, but the end result is, is very it is very similar that our that our traumas are are relieved and once they're relieved then we're back into the flow of our life I, one of the metaphors i just really like about psilocybin therapy is that imagine that your life that your life is like a, a ship you know and it's 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 anchored in a in a harbor but you can't you want to go sail your ship to get on with your life but you you can't get the anchor free it's stuck in the mud everything you try you try to get that anchor free and you just can't it's like psilocybin says, okay, I can free your anchor. If you come to me, say, look, I need help. Let's say the anchor is smoking. I, I want to stop smoking. You come to the mushroom and say, hey, Mr. Mushroom, you know, I want help with my smoking. Quit smoking. And the mushroom, in a large percentage of cases, does that. It, it's free. I'm now free. But now you have to decide where you want to sell your boat. And you have to go about sailing it. The mushroom doesn't do that for us, right? And so that's, that's again, where integration comes in. But it's just a, a nice way of thinking that because of injuries and lots of other reasons, our boats get stuck. I mean, I've said for, for decades, the best metaphor I can use to describe my beautiful, beautiful clients is that they're just stuck and they don't know how to get unstuck. And sometimes I know how to get unstuck, but I can't do it. And again, that's where the medicines are, are just so perfect for us. Yeah, the, the integration thing is, uh, I didn't really realize how important that was until I started working at there. So right. hearing about like, yeah. like Tom Hartle, he did his first psilocybin session over two years ago. And mm -hmm. I spoke with him recently and he said, you know, what's crazy is I, I still am realizing things from that first session. I'm still mm -hmm. integrating that experience, which is just yeah. like, it's really cool to think about that. It, like, yeah, that's me too. I stopped uh, doing medicine sessions a couple of years ago. I'd done three deep state uh, psilocybin sessions and each one there was like this massive download of, of insight and wisdom. And I finally said, you know, I got to I got to work with this for a while. It's going to take some time for me really to put into practice. And so I said, I'm just going to I'm just going to wait on doing more medicine sessions until I you know, can really spend some time integrating this fully into my life. So I, I agree with Thomas there. The research from Imperial College, this is really uh, kind of mind blowing. So Rosalind Watts is just one of the one of the real leaders in this space, and just a beautiful, caring human. And you know, the only time I ever saw her kind of tear up was when she was talking about this is the studies they did with treatment resistant depression. And they would say when folks wouldn't integrate, either they drop out the program or for whatever reason they didn't follow through. She said six months after the session, it seemed that their lives returned back to baseline, that the old patterns reemerge, and it's very very discouraging you know, for these people, because yet another treatment, you know, hasn't worked. And, you know, from that perspective, we can think of psilocybin and ketamine, uh, another psychedelic, but we can think of them as short acting medicines, right? They're, they're, they do this big ship for us, but in a large percentage of the cases, you have to then actually start practicing, reinforcing these changes so that they take greater root in the brain. And if you don't, there's, you know, what Rose Watts says, 60 to 80 percent of, of people will return kind of to within six months to where they were, which is hugely tragic, you know, because a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into these sessions, you know, they're from anxiety to money to whatever it might be, you know, to get it done. And so that's why for us at Theracell, integration is an absolute non-negotiable. And we're trying to support all of our practitioners with, with frameworks and, and models that can help them with their clients get integrating as quickly and easily as possible. That's kind of the, where we're at right now, trying to create those models for, for our, for our uh, clinicians. So I guess uh, that's probably a good point to maybe shift over a little bit into chatting about training, Dave, which you yeah. are, you are the man, you know, hey. you know everything. I'm a you. man. <laughs> so why, why is, why is training so important? Um, yeah, I'm, so in general, we're, we're, our, our training is available to healthcare professionals who hold professional uh, standing in, in, their, in their profession. And so basically we're talking about uh, docs and nurses and social workers and therapists. Um, and, you know, even though we've looked at that, we still say the primary guide is probably going to be a therapist because of their training uh, with, uh, with, you know, in, in therapy and whatnot. So 
Uh, it could also be a psychiatrist or a psych nurse or something like that, but folks with specific training in that area. Well, though all of those people I just talked about have been trained, because I know I'm, I'm a, I teach at the graduate level, I know how we train our therapists, uh, trained very much on an, an a, uh, taking an active role in the therapy, regardless of model. So that if you come to see me, you know, you're going to tell me things. I am now going to be using my model, my skills, my what, and, you know, and yourself as well to try to shift you, you know, we're going to do something to shift whatever it is you're wanting to change in your life. Okay. This model is very, very different. We say that the, the, the real therapist is a, is the human's own healing intelligence, their own ability to understand how to get their life back on, on, uh, in step with their values. As a matter of fact, we want to minimize any therapeutic engagement on that line. Now, this isn't to suggest that the therapists are passive. There's many things they have to do. Uh, I think of it like if you think of the, the therapy, especially the dosing session, as kind of a container, we have to make sure that container is well tended. But it's a it's a different way of, of working now, and it's a paradigm shift, really. And so we have to, like, invite therapists to step back from trying actually doing something to face with actually trusting them and really focus on helping them establish their intentions, you know, good assessment to make sure folks who weren't ready uh, don't, don't go into this, into this uh, procedure, but, and also to create a, a nurturing, loving uh, relationship with the client. I was with uh, one of our students in a deep state uh, session recently observing them and uh, the, the person having the journey said something like, uh, oh, I want to talk to my mother or something like that. It wasn't that, but it was that kind of a thing. And the therapist rushed over to start talking. I was like, no, 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 no. Come on back. Just let me hold space right now. They're doing their own work there. And and she said, wow, that, that just is so counterintuitive. I went, I know it is. And that's why you know, the training is, it's not com complicated in a sense. It's its pretty straightforward, but it's really important that we all agree to this kind of way of working that, that is first and foremost about safety for the client and efficacy in terms of outcomes. That's really what we keep our eye on the ball with. So ours is a five-day intensive training. It takes a takes some time for us to kind of get the model. And also, as you found in your cohort, as a cohort themselves to begin having their own kind of group psychedelic experience, but not with not necessarily with the medicine, but begin to feel a sense of uh, community, togetherness, um, love, connection that, that really are at the heart of this model. So it, it really, uh, it'd be nice if we could just kind of download a 30 minute, you know, webinar and, and learn it. But it, it really is, on, you know, it gets down to it, a, a very challenging model to put it into practice, however conceptually straightforward it might be. Yeah, I have I have a lot of people asking me like I don't understand why Therosil doesn't do a master class, an hour long master class on psychedelic therapy, and I didn't really have an answer as well as I do now after having done the training, and sure. just being there with the group was just like so it was just so great. Like I said, I yeah. made I made a bunch of new friends. Uh, the first day, you know, we're all can get into grips with each other, and then by day two. We're all like hugging and I love you and I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Right, right, uh, right, it, right. Yeah, and, yeah, it was just, uh, I know I'm biased because I work at there, so, but well, it was like. Well, you know, and, and we got to be, you know, grounded in how we talk about these things. But I, I don't know, John, I think something happened across this planet about 2014, 2015. I think so many of us just started waking up like, hey, our, our species is in a bit of trouble right now. And we gotta we gotta come together, and that's such a big part of it. Connect, yeah. agree. Hey, we've got to help each other. We've got to lay some prejudices down and some some those sorts of things down, so that we can really press forward. And so you experience that in your cohort. That's exactly what we want to happen. I can see it on your face when you talk about the energy that comes in, and that that's really what we want to bring to our our clients, right? That sort of uh, sense of of kind of call it a spirituality, a, a just something larger in itself, moving us forward with intelligence and, and, uh, and love. It's a, it's a powerful experience for people. And just uh, before I forget, I, you mentioned the relationship between the, the therapist and, and the patient in the moment and, you know, wanting to go help them. And I, I remember there was a moment during our cohort where we were doing the breathwork session and I had mm -hmm. never done breathwork before. Uh, okay. at least not on this level. And I, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a little skeptical that like anything would happen. And then sure, sure. I went, uh, like in the dyad partners, I went second and there was someone in the room when, when I was observing my partner who just started crying 
like really, really deep. Stop, yeah, stopping. right, right. And I yeah, was like, yeah. oh, jeez, oh my god. And watching th their partner rush to go help them and then take care of them, right? Yeah, Joe, Joe was like, no, 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 no. Right. And yeah, like, give them, but, let, they're doing their work right now. We're, we can hold the space for them. It's important that they feel we're there, we're caring, that they're safe, but they're doing their work right now. You know, who's a better therapist for me? Me or someone that doesn't live in my brain, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, but I, I love your story because that, that, that's the kind of, call it relearning or unlearning. I don't know which is right, but that has to happen. It was also just so great to see, like, it wasn't just the partner, like every other person in the room had that instinct to, I want to mm. go mm -hmm. help them. I want to go see. Of course you do. It's a beautiful, and, beautiful emotion, right? Yeah. But realizing like what, what our responsibilities are in that moment and how to yeah. really help oh, this person. Right. And by the way, the breath work is, it totally works. That person was sobbing. And then when I went 20 minutes later, I was deeply sobbing. During and my, you know, was, you could say the breath work works. Well, I mean, the breath work, the psilocybin, MDMA, fill in whatever blank you want for the altered state. All we have to do is create the conditions, John, for your own healing intelligence to say, hey, let's do this. Let's let's bring up whatever has been processed. Like if you're crying, you're connecting to something now deep. And that's that's, you know, it, like I think. I hear what you, so many people say what you say, you know, the breath work was so powerful. I couldn't believe it. Or, or, you know, the, the psilocybin, I can't believe it worked. And go, look, yeah, it's, those are just the, the, the agencies, which is what we're using. The real core is what's happening within you. And, and if you had that experience, that tells me so much about Joseph. It tells me it's about your dyad partner and the collective kind of community that's going in the room. Those are real energies. I know it's hard for us in science right now because we can't, can't measure them super well, but we know we can feel, oh, there's something going on. And you, you, you're being really honest. You weren't skeptical. But at the same time, I mean, in terms of active, this won't work. But there's a part of you that was just saying, I'm not sure. I mean, it doesn't seem like just breathing can, can actually do something. And then you opened yourself up to it. You'd seen something happen in the first hour. And as you relaxed and moved into it, of course, you're a human like anyone else. Your own healing agency said, hey, here's some wisdom for you. Here's some knowledge for you. Yeah, yeah I believe. I believe in the breath work. <laughs> I believe. I believe. <laughs> and again, it was, it was one of those things where um, we finished and we had a bunch of activities left for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And Dr. DeLeo, Joseph, he was just like, I think if it's cool with you guys, we should just take the whole day to talk about our experiences. And then yeah. like, the collective sigh of everyone like, oh, God. Yeah, like, that's what we want to do, right? Yeah, like, yeah, I, need to, yeah. I need to talk this through. And it was basically then the rest of the day was like a mini integration session. Right. And right. just talking right. about our experiences. And I was yeah. not expecting it. And it was... Um, you know, I would say I'm the same as you. When I, you know, when Yasmin said, hey, we want to, you know, obviously we can't do the experiential during the week with psilocybin or something like that. You know, what do you think about breath work? I was like, sure, I guess, whatever. I mean, I'm more, I'm more thinking. I just want to work with the, with the person holding space, and, and whatnot. And uh, you know, we had some really nice experiences in the first couple, but it was in our, I think, uh, one of our cohorts where we had a COVID outbreak during the. We were about to do our breathwork day, and so on. Oh, no, so we so had to go home. But the breathwork uh, specialist said, I'll. I can work with you this afternoon. So we all joined on Zoom and and we took part. I remember laying down, just down over there on the floor with the computer next to me as he's guiding us. And I had a powerful experience. And then when we did what you guys did, we talked about it online afterwards. Oh my gosh, it was insane how deep we went. And that's when I just exactly like you had, I went, oh, okay, really, we this is all about just creating an altered state in a container of love connection and then wonderful things are going to happen a large percentage of the time hey just so you know i got about 10 minutes because i got a client coming in so i gotta i got to cut off just so you know for the no worries that's this. that's great i have i have one more question that's that's yeah, burning okay. Um, okay burn burn baby and i know that this, this is something you've talked about a lot and i recently uh posted an article that uh, amanda siebert did with you in healing mag yeah. uh, or healing yeah. maps about why is it so important for healthcare practitioners to actually do the experiential dose as part of their training. Yeah. 
Yeah, for me, uh, you know, like I said, in my own training, this was, you know, really communicated to me this non-negotiable. And I guess part of me understood that. Yeah, you know, if you're going to invite people into an altered state, you, you need to kind of do it yourself to kind of say, hey, I, I did it. And that's, that's a big part of it. It's really, for me, it's now fully embedded in a safe, in safe treatment. So as I invite people to take at this dose, this kind of altered state dose, they are they are in a very, as you know, they're in a very different ter terrain of reality. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a useful terrain, but I have to have firsthand knowledge of what that's what that's like. So I can kind of guide them and help them, not intervene, not not direct them, but guide them, uh, even if the very least with my sense of confidence, trust in the medicine, you're OK. I know this is hard. As soon as the medicine leaves, you'll come back down to earth. Having that as an experiential knowledge within me allows me to be organic in the session. And if I didn't have that, if I didn't have that kind of subjective experience with this medicine at this dose, I, I really think I could be putting my, my clients and patients into, into an unsafe experience, and I'm not willing to do that. And I suppose it's it's got to be comforting for the patient to know that you have experienced this ineffable thing yeah. that, that, they're, yeah. that they're dealing with in that moment, right? It sure is. Now, for me, you know, I tell I try not to tell my clients my actual trip story because we don't oftentimes when you hear other people's stories, you kind of project your own experience toward that. And everyone's like snowflakes or fingerprints. Everyone's experiences is so unique and different. But I do tell them. You know that I I went in with just a you know a lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge. I had confidence in my guide. My heart was wide open. And I did seven grams for my experience, which is you know a massive dose. Never done measures before in my life. And uh, and as I laid down on the you know on the futon in his in his studio, and the music started, and and I started to kind of get into things just a little bit. The first thought that came through my mind was I don't want to do this. Mm. I, was ter I started to get panicky. And I started to get really scared and like, oh, no, oh, no, I don't think I want to do this. And as soon as I thought that, uh, he had these two little therapy dogs. One of the dogs had jumped up on the bed and it kind of came over to me and laid down on my legs. It was just, And I started feeling its energy and I was like, you know, if this little dog cares enough about me to tend to me. And I thought of my guide next to me, how much he cared for me. And my wife was praying for me. And I just thought of the, you know, medicine. I said, ah, fuck it, I surrender, you know. And, and I like to tell my clients that story so that they know, yeah, it's, it can be challenging, it can be tough, but it's beautiful. Because when I was done, I said, I said to my guide, he said, how was it? And I said, that was the most powerful spiritual experience of my entire life, and I'm never doing it again. <laughs> and not because it's bad, it's really intense. And I just think, <clears throat> you're right, my clients do appreciate knowing that, you know, that, that I've been through this, I understand the terrain. And, and so you can have trust in me as your guide to lead you safely through. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that makes sense, right? I mean, I've never done seven grams of, of mushrooms, Dave, but. Uh, you know what, the funny thing is the the more you take, you know, it's not more dangerous. You can't overdose on this. But I, I in, in clinical practice, I, draw, I do draw the line at seven. Not because it's worse, but I do find as people take eight, nine, and ten grams, uh, their trips can become far more amnesic. Mm. So they're not remembering, and I, I want them to be able to talk about their trips to be able to remember it. So I find for me seven is kind of nice. As a matter of fact, it's good because you know you're going to disengage or deactivate the default mode, mode network at that at that kind of level. So cool. Um, I guess maybe just as a, a last thing, last thing, if you have any. Like, what would you say to the folks at Health Canada right now who are, as I, Spencer, uh, the CEO there, so recently interviewed Bruce Tobin, and Bruce talked about how it seems like there there's games that are being played, and, and every time there's an exemption scheme that comes out, that and Theracil and the people that work around Theracil find a way to deal with it, that they have some other scheme that, that that's there to replace it. Yeah. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm, you guys have a far better insight into that level of things than I do. I, you know, I don't know if that's true or not true, but, but I would say a couple of things, you know, first of all, the health minister, your, your previous minister gave me an exemption to use Theracil in training, to use uh, psilocybin in training context. And you're saying no to other healthcare professionals who carry the same credentials. As I do, as far as I know, 
in Canada at the heart of our legal system is fairness. And that's not fair. And you better figure that out. Okay. Because that you, you know, for whatever reasons you allowed me, you did. So you're going to have to deal with all the other healthcare professionals who are asking the same thing. The other thing I would say is coming out of COVID, we are facing a mental health crisis like we have never, ever faced. And we had better be on board using these more progressive treatments that can help as many piece of people as possible. Yes, we will commit to safety. Yes, we will make sure we do these, these procedures as close to, to the best practice models we have. But there's a growing kind of um, energy in Canada, an awareness that these medicines hold some promise to relieve them of their depression, to relieve them of their anxiety, to relieve them of their trauma. And, it, you know, there's, there's going to be you know, a lot of negative pressure and, and what is perceived as the, as the government of Canada getting in the way of Canadians getting the help that they deserve. So I guess I would, you know, just say, you know, we're trying to work with you. We're on your side. We're trying to help Canadians in the best possible way that we can. Help us do that, please. That was good. That was searing. I love it. Searing. Searing. <laughs> Um, but I tried to watch my language. <laughs> oh, you did a great job. You did. Come and job. fucking arrest me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, save that for me. I'll say that. Later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Dave, thank you so much for for making the time and, and chatting. With you me. bet, brother. This has been great, and um, yeah, yeah. Look forward to chatting again really soon. Okay, take care.